Thank you all. And um, this, I'm Jim Todd from R.W. Beckett, and I really appreciate you being here today. Um, I hope you guys had an opportunity to catch Charlie's session this morning. If not, it certainly will be available to you later on. Uh, this session is uh, NFPA 31 tank installations, and the overview of the the presentation that I'm going to give you today is we'll focus on Chapter 8 of NFPA 31. Uh, we'll do a review of the NFPA regulations for oil tank installation and associated piping. Upon completion of the class, you should be able to state the clearance requirements for installation of oil tanks per code, state acceptable tank abandonment procedures, a very important one, adhere to the maximum fuel qualities acceptable as listed by code, design a system for multiple tanks, select the appropriate supply and vent material, locate the outside fill and vent pipes to code, install fill and vent piping to meet NFPA 31 code requirements, install proper valves for oil supply and return, understand the effect of head pressure on oil supply, state the maximum supply pressure to a fuel unit as mandated by NFPA 31, and state procedure for testing fuel system supply, um, uh, supply piping. So that's what we should work for. So we're talking about NFPA 31. Uh, what is NFPA 31? Well, that's the national standard for the installation of oil burning equipment. NFPA 31 covers all aspects of installation and operation of oil fired equipment and appliances. This presentation addresses chapter eight, uh, which is heating fuel piping system and components, along with some references to chapter seven, which uh, covers tanks and liquid fuels. NFPA 31 is the standard that all oil heat manufacturers of residential equipment list to. As an oil heat professional, you should have an up-to-date copy available for your reference. Ever seen any of these? Uh, you probably saw that and that and that and oh boy, that and last of all, there's a lot of different ways that people have put tanks in, uh, but we need to install those tanks to code. Whether we like it or not, uh, the NFPA 31 code will tell us how to do so. And if you ever run into a situation where a liability case crops up, even though you may not have code enforcement, they are going to go back to NFPA 31, and that's the standard they're going to call. The tank you install, though, must meet Chapter 7 of the NFPA 31, um, and that's going to talk about steel tanks. Uh, the steel tanks that we use, above ground tanks, are, have to meet UL uh, 80. Any above ground tanks that are listed to UL 142, that's a little different tank. Those are listed uh, for flammable and combustible fuels though they can be used for oil. Underground tanks must meet the re code requirements for the local authority. So you will have to check with your local authority if you're doing anything underground. 7.12 of NFPA 31 covers tank abandonment. And this I can't stress enough. Simply stated, if a tank and its related piping are abandoned for whatever reason, the tank and all piping connected to it, including outside fill and vent piping, and any piping connected to the appliance shall be emptied of all contents, cleaned, removed from the premises or property, and disposed of in accordance with the applicable local, state, and federal rules and regulations. Why? Well, here's the reason. This is from an ABC affiliate out of Silver Spring, Maryland. A fuel delivery company mistakenly dumped about 250 gallons of heating oil into a basement of a Silver Spring home, causing a nightmare scenario for the vacationing homeowners and their basement tenant. And I quote, it's a combination of errors, end quote. A person briefed on the hazmat incident told ABC7. The driver goes to the wrong house, it turns out the house they go to used to have heating oil, still has the hookups, no longer has the tank. They pump it in, there's no tank to catch it, and it flows like water. 
So you can see the mess and the downtown downstairs tenant woke up to a potent oil odor at 8.30 a.m. and was utterly confused, but had the sense to call 911. And unfortunately, folks, this happens quite often, too often, when someone does not abandon the tank properly. We will see in some areas that you, the homeowner is required to notify the local authorities when a tank has become abandoned, um, and especially their oil company. So watch yourselves with this. You may be held responsible if you do not follow the code. So you've pulled the tank out, you've had a problem with the tank and you need to put in a temporary can. Well, the code covers that too. And in the code, it states a, a listed safety can, less than six and a half gallons can be used as a t if a temporary can is needed. That's in 7.5.2. A tank of less than 10 gallon capacity shall not be installed within two feet of an ignition source. The ignition source is the appliance, folks, not some mystical point where the flame is. You've got to keep it away. When we get into tank placement, though, the tanks with a capacity of 10 to 1,350 gallons shall not be installed within five feet of any open flame or fuel burning appliance unless separated by a one hour fire rated barrier. The barrier must extend one foot horizontally past the appliance or tank, whichever is greater, and also extend to the ceiling. And that's out of 7.5.7. .7. So let's do some tank basics. Any tank between 10 gallons and 330 gallon capacity that is provided with an opening in the bottom for use as a fuel supply or drain shall be pitch towards the opening with a slope of not less than one quarter inch per foot. Each supply line shall be provided with a readily accessible thermally actuated shutoff valve as close as possible to the tank. When an oil filter or strainer is installed at the tank, it shall be within six inches of a thermally actuated shutoff valve. And these are codes that need to be adhered to especially the readily accessible. You know, readily accessible means I can get right at it. It's not accessible where I have to remove a panel to get to it. A readily accessible fusible link valve that closes against supply pressure shall be installed within six inches of the tank side of a filter within 12 inches of the inlet connection to the burner. So you don't have to put it right on the pump, folks. It, it can be within 12 inches of the of the inlet connection to that to that pump, and that's NFPA 31 8.10.6. Thermal actuated valves. An example of fusible link thermal actuated valves are shown here. So we have the underground under tank valves. Yeah, underground. That's good. Under tank valves up here. This is that bottom valve, and this is that side valve. Um, this is one to remember, guys. Uh, that could, might make it easier for you to service that, that filter, making it easier than trying to stand on your head trying to get to that valve itself. Then inline valves, as we see here, and then angle valves, as we see here. So those are the examples of the fusible link thermal actuated valves, all of which, uh, those are all firematic valves there that come from Beckett. We, that's our company now. Piping, and here's one that floors me. Uh, I don't know where they're missing, missing it. Uh, people are using all sorts of different materials for piping, but piping shall be made of the following materials using male or female threads of recognized thread specifications. Minimally, um, if you're using steel, it has to be schedule 40. If you're using brass pipe, the minimum is a schedule 40 brass pipe that conforms to the seamless red brass pipe standards. If that's out of NFPA 8.2.1.1, nowhere in there does it say that you can use plastic, PVC, or even copper. Um, you're not to use copper on the job. There is a note in the 
uh, recent NFPA that will be released where they will allow engineered systems and that's going to change the threading portion. So you may be able to use something like the product, the Megapress product. That's not right. Don't even think about it. Piping materials continued. Other piping that is part of an engineered fuel storage system can be installed in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions and approved by the um, authority having jurisdiction. So that's an NFPA 2.1.2, but that's still not right. Acceptable fittings and materials that we're working with, the types of materials, pipe fitting shall be malleable iron, steel, stainless steel, or brass with male or female thread types that comply with a recognized thread specification. They shall be made liquid tight with suitable pipe joint or sealing compounds. The fill and vent shall pitch back to the tank no less than a quarter inch to the foot. Hey, we got to get the, the pipes drained. They have to drain back. Cast iron fittings shall not be used, period. You're going to use malleable. Did I mention that's not right? Underground fill and vent piping shall only permit the following. It has to have a listed non-metallic piping that complies with UL 971 if you're using non-metallic piping. Listed metallic piping that complies with SU 971Z. Steel pipe that meets 8.2.1.1 and that's, that's uh, sentence one from NFPA 31. Brass pipe, and that's that red brass code, that meets 8.2.1.1, and that's the second sentence in that, in that chapter. Underground fill and vent shall be provided with double swing joints or flexible connectors, or shall be otherwise arranged to permit settling of the tanks without impairing the tightness of the, the piping system itself. It has to have a separate fill and vent. The vent has to be in an area where the it can be seen from the fill pipe. All connections must be made through the top of the tank. So that goes fairly straightforward for you. Continuing with piping, all tanks shall be equipped with a method for determining the fuel level. And we're going to have a gauge, as you can see a gauge here. The fill pipe to an underground tank on the last slide has no change in direction that becomes an acceptable place for gauging. You can go down the pipe to gauge the tank. We've got a mechanical gauge here. Other tanks shall have some method of gauging. An unused tapping on a twin tank can be considered a gauge port if you'd like. Uh, but the gauge is going to be installed on the last tank only to ensure leak-free crossover. Don't put a gauge on this tank. Put the gauge over here. Bottom supply takeoffs, as shown, will create an equalizer when we have twin tanks. So with cross-connected tanks, NFPA 31 8.9.3 permits cross-connection of up to four tanks, provided, provided the aggregate capacity does not exceed 1320, 1,320 gallons. Supply and vent piping must be in accordance with figure 8.9.3. This picture here is a clear violation of NFPA 31. A friend of mine sent me this picture and I was stunned with it. I couldn't believe it. Um, the installation has four 330 gallon tanks on it. The supply is one two inch pipe. This is the supply right here. To fill the tanks, and I don't know who did this, uh, they have a two by two by one inch T to each tank, and that's the fill. There are vent alarms on every tank. Uh, you know, if you're gonna do it, you might as well do it. If you're gonna do it wrong, you might as well go all the way. The gauge is on the last tank. Well, at least they did one thing right. However, the supply and return 
are from the top of the tank to a common manifold, and that's here on all four tanks. They have supply and return going up to a common manifold. The common manifold supplies one, count it, one oil-fired appliance. Talk about overkill. There is no method for equalizing the tanks. So it's just, it's, uh, it's the Wild West. I guess they're going to, I don't know, maybe they're going to overfill it and hope that it comes back in the supply pipe. I, I, I don't know what's going on here. Here's another cross-connected tank. Uh, these are three 275s or 330s. Oh, it's the installation of two, three 330s here. The supply is one two-inch pipe illustrated right there coming into this first tank. The vent, vent alarm, and gauge are on this tank right here. So at least they got the at least they got the gauge in the right spot and the vent in the right spot. The supply tapped off the first tank. Well, I don't know what this is over here, or is that a return, or uh, who knows what they've got going on with that. The supply tubing is off the bottom, and it acts as an equalizer for the three tanks. And that's right there. There's a crossover from the first tank to the middle tank, from the middle tank to the last tank. Now, what's wrong with this picture? Well, it's wrong because NFPA says they don't want it that way. It's not to be installed in that fashion. Here's how NFPA 31 calls for the installation of three 330s. We will have two separate supplies, one here and one here. We will have two separate vents and alarms, one here and one here. The gauge will be on the last tank of the twin tanks. The supply tubing off the bottom will create an equalizer for all three tanks. There's no question about that. Uh, and there's two inch crossover. The two inch crossover is going from this tank to that tank. When we run the vent and supply, NFPA 31 says minimally it has to be an inch and a quarter. So that's that. It's changed from that two inch vent from years gone by. Go and vent piping. Uh, the tank fill piping, the fill pipe shall be large enough and so located as to permit ready filling in a manner that minimizes spills. The fill pipe shall terminate outside of the building minimally two feet from any building opening. It must be piped in a manner that prevents spills when the filling hose is disconnected. The end must be equipped with a tight metal cover to resist the entry of water and marked as a heating fuel uh, fill opening. That's not gonna work. That's inside a building. You know, you'll see the vent is sitting here. It's still inside and they're filling it inside. When we talk about the tank vent piping, we don't want this to happen. The vent pipe shall be large enough and so located as to permit adequate normal fill and emergency venting. The vent pipe shall terminate outside of that building, minimally two feet from any building opening. When we're working with an underground tank or an underground fill, like a sidewalk fill, the tank vent piping shall terminate high enough above the ground to avoid being obstructed by snow and ice. Vent pipe shall terminate within 12 feet of the fill pipe and at a point visible from the fill location. Outer end shall terminate in a corrosion resistant weatherproof cap. So that's our fill and vent. So let's get into fill and alarm gauges real quick. Tanks which do not have fuel maintained by a pump must have a method to determine the fuel level. The gauges must be listed to ANSI UL 180 and be installed to the manufacturer's instructions. Above ground tanks that do not exceed 330 gallons shall rely on an audible alarm to determine safe fill levels. That's our whistle that we're going to hear when we're filling that tank. Support and foundations. 
comes from 7.3. The tanks and their supports shall rest on foundations made of solid concrete designed to prevent uneven settling. Support shall be integral to the tank or of concrete, solid masonry, or steel. Outside tank supports shall be firmly anchored to that foundation. Every tank shall be supported in a manner that prevents excessive loads on the supporting portion of the shell. I, let's go back to that tank real quick. That's, that's not a setup, folks. That's actually in place. Somebody is actually using that tank and somebody else is filling it. Boy, isn't that scary. Fuel supply and return piping. Fuel supply piping between the tank and the appliance shall be at least a nominal 3 8 inch piping or tubing. It has to be sized large enough for the input rate of the appliance itself. There will be provide, you must provide a shutoff valve at the outlet for above ground tanks, as shown in this picture from SunTech, and provide a shutoff valve where an oil line enters the building for an underground tank. Uh, the other thing that I didn't mention there is the piping has to be protected. The supply and return lines shall have threaded ends or of tubing intended for flared or engineered connections. Compression fittings do not meet the code, period. Do not use or modify a fitting as to circumvent the requirement to prevent an accumulation of water in the tank. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, at one time you could buy a valve that had a little bit of a stem on it that went up a little higher so that if you had sludge in the bottom of the tank, it would get above the sludge. That's not acceptable. You can't drain the water out of that tank. That can't be done in that fashion. If you have a return line, no valves or obstructions shall be installed in that return line, except you're allowed now to install a hard seat or ball valve if you do, it has to be left in the open position with the handle removed, and it's going to enter. Return lines will always enter the top of the tank. 8.7.4 references pressure at the fuel unit and states, the pressure at the fuel supply inlet to an appliance shall not exceed a gauge pressure of three pounds per square inch unless the appliance is approved for a higher inlet. Now with most residential applications will fall under this rule. If the oil tank is installed above the mechanical room, you should consider the inlet pressure that's going to occur with it. And we'll go over that right now. So the pressure uh, that we're working with, we're gonna convert head pressure to PSI. Pressure measured at the base of a one foot column of water will exert um, 0 0.4335 pounds per square inch gauge. Specific gravity is going to place, uh, play an important part in our calculations. And for our purpose, the formula that we're going to use to convert feet of head to PSI is uh, the pressure per square inch will be 0.434 times the specific gravity of the fuel and that will give the fluid, and that will give us our, our pressure per square inch for one foot. Specific gravity for water is one, which makes it easier for me. I don't do math very well, if you know me at all. Reference their specific gravity to calculate other fluids. That's what we're going to do, and I'll go into that just shortly. So, converting head pressure uh, to PSI, Fluids exert pressure. Pressure creates resistance to flow or movement, depending on the application. Resistance to flow is addressed by a pump to move or utilize the fuel. Equipment selection must be capable of delivering the fluid within the design requirements. So let's go through this scenario. The storage tank is above the pump. The product delivered from the tank is ASTM D396 or number two fuel oil. NFPA 31 8.7.4 states that the inlet pressure to the pump shall not exceed three PSI unless the appliance is approved for higher inlet pressure. 
So what we'll do is we'll calculate the specific gravity of number two fuel oil as biodiesel. And that's based consistent with the ASTM D396. So in that case, we're working with biodiesel. So our specific gravity is going to be a 0.886. So we take and round that off to 0.89. So our, our head pressure is going to be, um, our pressure is going to be the head, whatever it is in feet ahead, times 0 0.434, that's the PSI for, uh, that's the head pressure for water, times the specific gravity of 0 0.89, or um, the, the head, height of the head, times 0 0.386. And that's what that works out for when we get the math. So we're gonna calculate the inlet pressure. So we've got a height here, we're working with our formula. Consider this a tank on grade, supplying a burner in an eight foot high basement. The inlet is one foot above the basement floor. The tank's on 12 inch legs, so I have a four and a half foot full height from grade. 4.5 times se plus, plus seven is 11.5 feet. 11.5 feet times 0 0.386 gives me an inlet pressure of 4.439 pounds per square inch on this particular application. That's above my three inch, uh, three pound uh, pressure. So I'm going to need to install a pressure reducing valve at the burner. The examples of pressure reducing valves that are easy enough for us to find are the Webster OSV, which is up here, or the SunTech PRV, which is down on the bottom. This addresses two issues. It addresses code compliance. It will also address pressure fluctuations. Each style valve is installed downstream of an oil filter. Remember that, you're not gonna use this. Some people will install the OSV to protect the oil filter. You can't do that. You've gotta protect the OSV. There's a diaphragm inside there. There's a diaphragm and a needle valve, and you don't want to get any gook, um, I guess the technical word is junk or gook, in there uh, to hang that needle valve up. Keep the product free of debris, and you're going to do that with your filter. Once we've done that, the oil pump pressure should be adjusted after the installation of the pressure reducing valve. Remember that fuel units work by their positive displacement design. What that means is positive displacement means that the fuel unit proportionally displaces the fuel based on the inlet pressure. Assuming that that fuel unit is all set is a common mistake. Don't do it. Uh, when you're commissioning a burner, you wanna know what your fuel pressure is and you wanna make certain that it's set accordingly. Fuel line sizing. There are fuel line sizing formulas for one pipe systems and they're used to ensure there's enough supply for the appliances themselves. You can find that formula in SunTech's installation and service manual, section two, page 10. And you can download that right from the internet. Select the formula based on the system design. Make oil line lengths as short as possible and use caution when installing fittings and valves. You'll see that if the tank is above the pump, change the negative to a positive. Um, fittings, valves, and filters will reduce the total length allowed. Vacuum created by lift systems. The gear set creates a point of negative pressure or vacuum. Vacuum draws the product into that fuel unit. The fuel lines must be sized to ensure adequate flow. Vacuum, the absence of pressure, can cause the fuel to off gas, which will create microbubbles. The micro bubbles will change the fuel ratio, fuel to air ratio from fuel lean to air rich. So watch yourself with it. That's many times the problem that you're running into when you can't get that burner to work properly or you're getting some after drip. Many times it's the micro bubbles inside. With vacuum, um, if we go to section four, page 10 of SunTech's installation service manual, we'll see the vacuum limits and they are based, uh, are established and based on the fuel unit and the system design. Always con consult a gauge reading. If the gauge reading exceeds the manufacturer's listed maximum, 
you must consider other options. Fuel line sizing formulas are available for gravity systems and lift systems. Lift systems should be sized to ensure performance issues are not encountered. Fuel unit manufacturers provide sizing charts for lift as well as these formulas. So watch yourself with it. Many times we'll find out that we wanted to use 3 8 inch tubing because we always did it that way on that lift system. And if we simply went to a half inch tubing, we could get better performance out of it. So you can check with SunTech's installation and service manual. This partic these particular charts come from section three, page eight. Total gear set capacity. There's a mouthful, TGSC. That references the quality of fuel pumped by a fuel unit when installed on a two pipe system. Why is this important to us? Well, the total gear set capacity must be considered when selecting fuel filters, as well as for sizing the oil supply line. Oil supply is limited to the nozzle size on one pipe system, so we don't really worry about it. But when we get into two pipe systems, we've got something else going on. And here's my total gear set capacity. So I'll take my mini pump. If I've got a mini pump that's rated for three gallons per hour, my total gear set capacity is 17 gallons per, um, per hour. What does that mean? That means that I will be drawing 17 gallons in to the pump per hour. Then I'll have the oil going out of the nozzle and I'm gonna use a one gallon nozzle. So I have the oil going out as uh, my inlet value for the nozzle is one gallon. That means I've got 16 gallons going back. That's on that three gallon. If I go to the seven gallon, I go up to a 20, uh, 20 uh, gallon total gear set capacity. When I start to get into some of my B pumps, you'll see that it gets higher to 21, 25, and that's that return line. Um, and on and on it goes. Uh, when you start working with the J pumps, it goes way up. Uh, so you've got quite a bit to work with there. Bypass loop. Uh, here's one way to get away from that return line. Bypass loops are created by installing the bypass plug and a return line that tees into the supply. A common application of a bypass loop is a deaerator, such as the Tiger Loop. Um, bypass loops are always installed after the filter. Consider a bypass loop if there is a marked temperature difference between the oil tank location and the appliance. It'll give you an opportunity to warm up some of that fuel. If you run into a situation where you typically would run a return line because that's the way you always did it, get rid of that return line if you can and use a deaerator. Uh, use that rather than that return line. You will be drawing only the nozzle quantity through the supply line and my total gear set capacity will happen here. So you'll be fine with sizing your, with your, sizing your filter. Testing of fuel supply piping. Unless fuel supply and fittings are visible for inspection, they shall be tested for leaks by either a pressure or vacuum test. Before conducting the tests, any supply tank and fuel burning appliance shall be isolated from the pressure unless it is rated for the applicable test pressure or vacuum. Pressure testing for leaking shall be conducted for all portions of supply pipe to be evaluated. You'll do so with air or an inert gas. You're not gonna use oxygen. It must, be, uh, it must be able to hold integrity for no less than 10 minutes. And the gauge pressure that we're going to go to is going to be of at least uh, five pounds per square inch gauge, but never greater than 10 pounds per square inch gauge. So that's what we're gonna shoot for. So how are we gonna do it? Well, we're gonna test with air or an inert gas. In this case, let's say that we're using nitrogen. And we're gonna perform a soap and bubble test once we get going. And then we're gonna pressurize it, but do not, uh, to five pounds, but do not exceed 10 pounds. It has to be able to hold that for a minimum of 10 minutes. So that's this valve is shut off. This valve's open with my pressure on there. I'll close the, the valve here and I'll watch my gauge and I should be able to hold, hold my pressure. I can also do it with vacuum. 
And with vacuum, I'll uh, pull it down to at least 20 inches of vacuum. Uh, to test, hold the vacuum for a minimum of 10 minutes. Any leakage will be determined by, determined by a loss of vacuum. So I can do that with a hand pump, or I can do that with a vacuum pump. In conclusion, please, abandoned tanks and piping must be removed. You're giving us a black eye every time we get a spill. Tanks must be installed on a substantial supporting surface. Fill and vent piping to the outside with two foot, um, must go to the outside with a two foot minimum clearance to any of the building openings. There has to be an audible alarm and gauge provision for above ground tank installations. Our terminations outside are not coffee cans. They have to be weatherproof ends on the terminations with fill located to minimize leaks. All piping and tubing must be substantially supported and protected from damage. All piping and tubing must meet code. Threaded or flared fittings are going to be the only thing we use on the supply. We're not using compression fittings. Let's knock that off now. Readily accessible fusible link safety shutoff valves shall be used at the burner location, at the tank, and at the entrance of the building if I've got an underground tank or an outside tank coming in. Oil supply must be tested by pressure or vacuum before placing the tank into, into service. So that's that. If you want more information, uh, you can visit us at beckettcorp.com or you can contact us. Uh, we have a we have a email address, techquestions at beckettcorp.com. One of us will answer that as quickly as we can. If you'd like, you can give us a call. We have a dedicated call center, technical call center at 1-800-645-2876. If you don't want to remember the numbers, remember 1-800-OIL-BURN, if you still can find the letters on your keypad. You can also please, I please come down and uh, visit us at our Beckett uh, virtual booth at the EE. We look forward to having you there. So thank you all. Thanks very much. And then we'll go for questions. Danny. All right. Thanks, Jim. Uh, so everyone, thank you uh, again for for joining us. Uh, as we get into the the Q and A session, we got about fifteen minutes uh, for Q and A. Um, before anybody runs out, a uh, couple of things. Uh, the PDF to the presentation that you just saw is available to you uh, on your GoToWebinar control panel. You'll see a section called Handouts. I just posted the PDF to the presentation, so feel free to take that. Um, additionally, in the chat section on the GoToWebinar control panel, I posted the link to the other uh, training sessions that um, that we're doing in conjunction with the uh, Eastern Energy Expo virtual conference. Uh, one of them happened this morning, but you can still register register for it and get it on demand. Um, and then we have another session this afternoon at 3 p.m. and another one next Thursday, uh, also at 3 p.m. Uh, so feel free to register for those. And then um, as we get into the Q and A ses uh, session here. Um, Let's uh, you feel free to send your question through on the questions panel on your GoToWebinar control panel, um, or you can raise your hand and I will unmute you and um, and then that way you can ask the questions directly. Uh, so we have one question uh, that already came through, uh, Jim. And this one <clears throat> um, is from Leo. So hang tight here. Let me. Unmute Leo. Hello, Leo. Uh, go ahead. Uh, I saw your question come through, but I think it's better if you just ask it directly. Thank you, Danny. Um, hey, Jim, Leo Veruso here. Hey, Leo. Hey, um, as usual, uh, you know, a great presentation. I, I learned so much. Um, wish it was in person so that I can share you know publicly or in a in a in-person venue but 
this virtual one's going to have to do. Um, so from all of us here at AFS, I just want to congratulate Jim for recognition under OESP Hugh McKee Award. Um, can't imagine anybody more fitting. So, so Jim, congratulations, well deserved and um, a long time coming. So I just wanted to say that publicly. Wish it was in a room full of people, but we'll have to take it virtually. Leo, thank you so much. Thanks. It's it's people like you that have made it possible for me. I appreciate it immensely. So um, you're welcome. I'm, and then I'm, if you don't mind, I do have just a quick question. Jim, these sure. were all, and I know this session was titled Installation per NFPA. At what point, you know, since we saw so many of those photos of poor installations, at what point do we in the field try to fix some of these? Uh, is it five years, 10 year old units, purely on safety? At what point, and I know it's judgment at some point, but maybe you could share for all of us, at what point do we take some of these known shortfalls and try to correct them? Thank you. Well, thank you, Leo. Um, thanks so much for that question. That was a great one. I, you know, from my experience in the trade, and it's, look, you, you got to do it right away. You, you can't wait. If you've got, if you've got somebody that has a clear cut violation to the code presenting themselves, and I don't care about this grand for, grandfathering story. And I, I also, I also don't care about the story that, oh, we don't have any code enforcement. You've got enforcement. Um, if anything happens, you are the last hands on that job. And if anything happens after you leave, they're going after you. Um, you're liable for it. You, you've got a certain uh, amount of liability for that, for the, for the problems that crop up. Some of those tanks there obviously should have been shut down. Uh, they just should have been red tagged and shut down and people should have refused to fill them and they should have at least notified a local authority that that liability existed. Um, there was one tank there that was split open. Uh, that's a scary, scary situation that can crop up. Uh, you know, those tanks that were up in the up in the air, one of the tanks was installed on ledge, and I don't know how it was installed, and that's permissible if it's if it was installed properly. But boy, oh boy, I want to make certain that it was installed properly, because that would be one heck of a mess. Um, as far as the lifetime of a tank, well, that's a tough one. I'm sitting here with a tank in my house that's 20, 24 years old, and I normally change my stuff every 20 years. I haven't changed my tank, and I feel bad that I haven't. And I'm using the thing that I would do in the trade. I'd look at the tank and, oh, it looks good, so I'm not changing it. Well, uh, I don't know what's going on in the inside of that tank. Tanks, uh, the, the tanks have a useful lifetime, and the customer should be made aware that look, your tank's over 20 years old. You, you might want to start saving to replace it and get that thing out of there before they have a catastrophic failure. I, I know that a, a, a minimal leak coming out of the bottom of the tank is easy to address with a magnet patch. I've done it. Um, I've done it on more than one occasion. Does that make it right? No, it's a temporary fix until I can get that tank pumped out and replaced. That's what it's there for. Um, I've put tank bottoms on. I know that. Uh, that's not uncommon in, in years gone by. Is it right? No, no, it really isn't. That's not the right way to tank, uh, address a leaking tank. Um, and you have to put it in properly. You know, we've got jobs out there today. You'll see them as you go along with outside tanks that are installed on slab, on, on grade. And what do they have underneath it? Well, they, they stuffed a couple of, uh, they couple stuffed a couple of rocks under it or maybe they put a brick under it or something to hold the tank i don't know what the structural strength of a brick is but uh you know if you're filling up a 275 and you're hoping that leg sitting against the brick isn't going to crack the brick well you'd be have a better chance of hitting the lottery because sooner or later it's going to happen so leo brings up some really important points if we don't do this we're going to destroy our industry um, and this is a great industry. This industry has been great for me since I got out of high school. 
Um, and that wasn't yesterday. Uh, that was 50 years ago. And uh, I, I, can't, I can't tell you the appreciation I have for the oil industry. I also can't tell you how much I fear for the oil industry because we're taking shortcuts. Not all of us. The good guys are there. We've got to, we've got to protect our industry. And, and we start out with the tanks and the way the tanks are piped. You don't pipe with PVC. That's, that's ridiculous. You don't solder copper piping to a copper tube into the, for your fill and vent. That's nuts. I, sooner or later, you got to work on it. You got a fire hazard there. So to Leo's point, if you see something, address it, get it taken care of. If the customer refuses to address it, well, you're going to have to bring it back to your office and say something. I mean, don't leave there without a, a ticket that's signed off on that you you told the customer of this presenting issue. I, the one that goes back on that I remember was I fortunately had a, a driver one time. We pulled up to an outside tank. Uh, he pulled up to the outside tank. He didn't like the looks of it. He wouldn't fill it. And he came back to the office and told us he's not filling the tank. And he left a tag on the customer's door. I'm not filling that tank. That tank split that night and it was on a, it was right near a pond and the small amount of oil that was down in the bottom took off for the pond. We would have had a heck of a problem there. Um, it's, it needs to be addressed. That was a, an oddball one that happened to happen at the same time, but it, it can happen. It can happen to you. So thank you. Uh, oil lines, return lines, get rid of the return lines for Pete's sake. If you get a return line that breaks, remember that total gear set capacity, the oil is going to spray into the ground or some undetected area at total gear set capacity less the nozzle. So if I have a one gallon nozzle, 160 gallons in my tank, and it runs for 10 hours, I'm gonna drain the tank with a mini pump and I'm gonna put 160 gallons somewhere that I can't see. And I can't test it. There's, there's no way for me to test the return line. Oh, well, there's ways to do it, but it's not an easy test to do. It's not like testing the supply where I, you know, I can pull on it and see my vacuum and so forth. I can't do that with a return. It's going into a tank. If you put 160 gallons of oil into the earth, mother nature's not gonna like you. And the Department of Energy of uh, Environmental Protection is going to be after you in a heartbeat. So, so so much for the lecture. Thanks again, Leo. Thanks everyone for listening to me. And Danny, I'll turn it back to you after I get off this soapbox. I think uh, Leo had a follow-up to that. Uh, go ahead, Leo. Sure. Hey, and, and you're right, Jim. The to be in the in the local news when everybody has a cell phone camera today, whenever there's a spill or a release, it's just bad news. You know, not just you know, not just for the customer, the industry, the dealer, the last service technician, everybody. Um, the only thing I, I wanted to follow up is on new wind, new oil tank installations. I don't know if it's just up here, but I wanted to throw out. We've seen is we've seen a lot of water coming in new oil tanks right from the supply house and yep. not sure if it's coming in from the plugs or from um you know the the plugs being put in during transport but may just you know uh comment to throw out there that you know i know a lot of folks have shared with me that their protocol is to you know hold the tank upside down prior to installation to try to evacuate any water that might have weeped in. So just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, thanks, Leo. That's a very important point. point. And it, it, it's happening quite frequently now. And um, there's, there's a host of things that will happen with that water in the tank. We need to get the water out of that tank before fuel is introduced to it. You know, the part guys don't understand is when you introduce fuel into a tank with water in it, if the water has started, uh, creating any microorganisms in there or feeding any microorganisms may occur, you're going you're gonna to be hard pressed to clean that up. And unfortunately, we're going to blame the fuel. It's not the fuel. 
we should have got the water out of it to start with. And that's why the tanks need to be um, pitched a quarter inch um, to the foot towards the outlet. Um, even if it's outside tank and you're not putting a, you're putting a plug in it, well, I wouldn't put a plug in it. I would put something in there so that I could drain, I could check to make certain there wasn't any water in the bottom of that tank. Um, you know, there's provisions to do that. So thanks, Leo. Very, very wise comments. Very well timed. All right, Jim. Back got to a... you, Danny. I'm off my soapbox. <laughs> All right. I uh, got a couple that came through um, during the presentation. Um, let me see here. We don't go by any codes in our area. Why do I have to worry about an FPA 31? Not sure. Because uh, when thing, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. is the person on or? Uh, no, well, I can, I can tell you what's going to happen. No, they left. Yeah. When things go bad, things will get worse. If you have no codes in your area or no code enforcements, you actually do have a code that we are going to go to if there's a liability issue, and that code is NFPA 31. If you look um, at any of the installation manuals, they are going to state that it has to be installed to a minimum of NFPA 31 or um, the area having jurisdictions codes, whatever is greater. If there's a failure of any sort and the insurance company gets involved, they are going to look at the installation. They're gonna have a forensic engineer look at that installa installation. And if it's not up to code, you're gonna get ticked for it. That's gonna be the standard that they judge your installation by. You don't meet it, you violate it, guess what? Pay the guy on the way out because the, the the claim goes right to you. Your, your guilty is charged. So that's why you want to do it. You need to know the codes. You need to you need to install and service to codes. Period. There's no question about that. All right. What else you got, uh, Danny? We got a question coming through here. Uh, Earl, uh, you are unmuted, Earl. Uh, so you raise your hand. Go ahead with your question if you if you're on. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. I can. Yeah, I this is, but this is Mark from Hummelstown Fuel. Uh, uh, question about the fusible links at the tank. Uh, yep. Yep. Are, are they are they required? Because we're we're getting them that, that they're they're just the ball valve. And then like our, our inspectors, they you know some of them they're if they don't know how to shut them off properly, that these inspectors don't know how to shut them off properly at all. I mean, are required to have them fusible links or? Whereabouts, where's the tank, Eric? Is it outside or inside? Inside. Inside, you can have a ball valve and then you have to have the fusible link. You can use the ball valve if there's a ball valve underneath the tank. Um, but you have to have a fusible link at the tank. What we want to do is we want to shut off the supply of oil in the event of a fire. Now there has to be a fusible link there. Even so you can use like both. Our, 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 like our, our uh, inspectors don't really uh, violate us for for that at all. They're not really checking them out. Yeah, they're not pick. Yeah, they're not picking up for it. But the code states that you have to do it. So you want to go by the NFPA 31 code. Um, if you look at your, you know, I don't know whose tanks you're buying, but they're going to talk, they're going to reference how it's to be installed and uh, they will reference NFPA 31. You can have the ball valve there, that's fine, but you want to have a fusible link there also. Uh, that meets code. This is uh, Dave. I'm and the fact that you. This is Dave. I'm sitting here. I'm with sorry. You. My name is Dave. I'm sitting here with Mark. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Go ahead, Mark. Dave. Okay, originally from Lehigh Valley, land of inspection. We always yep. put automatic valves on at the oil tank. The inspectors did not yep. turn it off. The customer did not turn it off. 
you know, you think code okay. and we had to have an angle firematic valve at the pump itself. That was code. So as long as we had the firematic at the pump, we could put a regular valve at the tank. Is that acceptable? Now you still have to have, you can have a ball valve at the tank if that's what you need to have your customers so they know how to turn it off, but you're supposed to have a firematic valve there. There's supposed to be a firematic be valve it. at the tank also, a fusible length. So putting one at the pump wouldn't cover you then? That's part of it. Yeah, it doesn't cover you entirely. No, it doesn't. I mean, a lot of guys will say, well, I can only put it at the pump because I got an outside tank. But the code says when the lines come into the building, there has to be a, a shutoff valve there, fusible link valve there too. Yeah. Um, we want to we want to stop the oil from feeding that fire. Right. Yeah. You yeah. Know, uh, let's, say that, let's say that the oil link. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's what we're trying to do. We follow all the code, but when local code inspectors would come in back there, in every township. Every city, they all had their own inspections. This is kind yeah. of what we ran into back then. And it's true, the customer goes down, they can't shut, you know, if there's a leak or something, but understand with, so you would say to, to put a, uh, a red valve and then just put a uh, firematic on the other side of it before you go to the burner. Yeah, you can do it. Yeah, do a firematic before you hit the filter. Um, so you can have an under tank. I know there's an under tank valve that's a ball valve that you can buy, and you're buying them over in the Lehigh Valley and so a lot of other places sell them. Uh, run that into a firematic valve. Just leave the firematic valve um, fusible link. It doesn't have to be firematic. The fusible link valve. Just leave the fusible link valve open. Okay, very good. That's what I'm okay. saying. And that way, if anything, yeah. This is what I'm saying is there's so many, we're in Dolphin County and there is no inspection out here. So I guess what I'm going to say is that, you know, everybody has their own rules and regulations. So we end up having to follow what, well, that inspector that was, and they came in to inspect oil tanks back there. So in the Lehigh Valley area. So, okay, very good. I understand where you're coming good. from. Good. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. All right, everyone, I think- uh, Yeah, nothing. Go ahead, Jim, go ahead, please. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with belt and suspenders. I'm old, I wear a belt and suspenders. You know, there's nothing wrong with them. <laughs> All right, everyone, uh, so, I think uh, we're gonna adjourn. Um, wanna be respectful of everyone's time. Um, if you didn't, um, if you had a question that didn't get addressed, um, you will have, uh, we'll send a follow-up email to everybody um, either later today or tomorrow. Uh, so feel free to, you know, reach back. I will put in all of the information for um, the email addresses and the website and the places where you can go get more information on this topic. Um, also, if uh, just make sure that you download the presentation slides before you leave. And um, again, we'd love to see you at any of our other uh, training sessions. Um, through the link that was provided. Um, thanks again for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you again at a Beckett online training session in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you, folks.